So we're beginning a, a new series this morning uh, on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is found in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, and also in Luke uh, chapter 11, verses 2 to 4. And uh, I'm going to read actually from Luke's version this morning. I'm going to read from the beginning uh, of this chapter. So from Luke verse 1 to 4. Uh, now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And uh, some manuscripts in Matthew's version add, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, which is based on 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Or as some versions put it, may your name be held holy, uh, which I actually prefer. I think uh, we don't really use the word hallowed very much anymore, do we? So may your name be held holy. Um, perhaps is more contemporary and, uh, and just gives us maybe a clearer picture uh, of what it means. And what's interesting, I think, in, in Luke's uh, version of this prayer is really the lead up to it. The disciples coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And I don't know about you, but over the last couple of years, uh, particularly when the pandemic struck and we went into lockdown, uh, I was just really in a place of thinking, Lord, how do I pray? Uh, Lord, how do we pray? And uh, that's continued at some level. And, and then obviously the uh, war in Europe and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And again, really saying the same thing, <laughs> saying, Lord, you know, just uh, how do how do I pray? How do how do we pray? So I can kind of empathize with uh, the disciples question. And actually, it's interesting that they ask this question because it's the only recorded incidents in the Gospels of the disciples actually coming to Jesus and saying, would you teach us something? Uh, that yes, there are questions and yes, learning's taking place all the time. Uh, but it's the only time they actually come and say, would you please teach us something, Jesus? And why do they ask the question? And I think obviously they knew that they should be praying, that there was, uh, you know, John's disciples had prayed and that was part of their following God and part of their discipleship. But they'd also seen Jesus, and it says in verse 1, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, that they'd seen something, they'd just seen something about the life of Jesus, that they'd been with him, that he knew the Mount of Olives was somewhere where he went and where they often went together to pray. And uh, in their times, which weren't so different from our own, uh, they were times of uh, disease, at times of plague. There were times when... Um, towers would fall upon people. There were tragedies. There were times of uh, dictatorship. There were people who would, you know, kill people, even people in their own family, just to protect their own ego. And uh, it, it was a time of occupation as well. And yet they saw something in Jesus. They saw something of his relationship with his father. They saw something of the security that he had in God that somehow helped him to overcome and to find joy and to find life even in the midst of the times in which they lived and perhaps it just stirred within them something of a hunger uh, for God and for deeper relationship with the Father. I think and so Jesus he, he gives them this prayer and some of the things would have been familiar to them uh, but uh, it begins with our Father and it's really notable it is our Father. He doesn't say say my Father but there's something about prayer that he's saying and something about walking together as disciples. It's our father. I have a friend who's really interested in the kind of the Jewish roots and background of the faith. And he tells me that actually if uh, when Jesus called somebody to follow him in that culture, said, follow me, it would never have been understood simply as an individual 
calling. It would have been much more nuanced than that. It would have been understood as following with others, as following uh, with a habarim, with a, a group of disciples. Uh, it wouldn't have been just understood as a, a one person sort of enterprise. I think it's just demonstrated uh, really well, actually. Who was around for our Easter Sunday service at the amphitheatre? Anybody? Yeah, it's it a good it's a good day, wasn't it? I quite enjoy those days at uh, the amphitheatre. It's where everybody kind of brings their deck chairs and their dogs, and it, it feels like the uh, the church is kind of going on holiday. At, uh, I'm not sure Matt Hebdige is quite so keen on the dogs, though. But, <laughs> 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 um, but it was a good day for another reason, that uh, Lee was baptised on that day. And uh, what was really interesting was Lee, he's baptised into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he's baptised into uh, the three persons, one God, baptised into the Godhead, this mystery that is the Trinity, baptised into this relationship. And in the water with Lee, we've got Matt and we've got uh, Caroline and around them we've got Lee's mum, Hilary, uh, and we've got other people who are really special to Lee, who've been important to him on his journey, praying for him. And yes, Lee is making an individual decision, but he's being baptized into a discipleship, a, a walk together with other people. It's like a corporate following. And perhaps as we say, our Father, there's something that Jesus indicates in prayer as well, that it's, uh, yes, the secret place is, is important and valuable, but there's something about a corporate journey and exploration together in prayer as well. As she says, our Father as well. So locates this prayer at the very beginning in relationship. It's very easy to perhaps take the, the values of our culture and put them onto prayer and put them onto God. Um, what, do you think, what do you think some of the values of our culture are? What does our culture value much? Does anybody want to value most? Does anybody want to sort of have a think and call out any any thoughts. Equality. Equality, okay, yeah. Anything else? Celebrity. Celebrity. Oh, Neil, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a big thing, isn't it? Celebrities now. Yeah. I think also economy. Um, certainly where I work in the NHS, that's been very clear over the last 15 years, is I think we almost get into a place where we know the the price of everything and the value of, of nothing, really. It's very much based on, is it efficient? And uh, what's the economy of this? And I think if we take that and put it onto prayer and put it onto God, that can become problematic. Does it work? Does it feel good? Is it efficient? But actually, right at the start, Jesus says, no, this is about relationship, about relationship with the Father. Uh, and yes, some people here will have not have had good relationships with their, their father or father was absent and would you know, definitely need some healing around that. But Jesus is pointing to a relationship that should be really positive, that should be nurturing, uh, that should involve provision and protection. And so actually at the start of the Lord's Prayer, we find that it's us together in relationship with God. Our Father in heaven, what do we think of? And uh, just a question just to have a little ponder what do you think of when you hear the words in heaven in the Lord's Prayer? A father near to us or a God far away? What do you think of when you hear the words in heaven in the Lord's Prayer? A father near to us or a God far away? Maybe neither. But just have a think and just be really honest. Probably your first reaction is the, first, is the, is the correct one, is the, the, the honest one. Um, I think for me, I've often seen God as being maybe far away. And when you say in heaven, you almost think of like a distance that you've got to travel. And in the ancient world, there was quite a, a complex theology around heaven. And uh, I want to just, uh, just say this, that, you know, yes, there is a place where those who have gone before us in Christ exist in eternity with him in glory. But God is with us. And this is really important when we come to prayer. This is from Teresa of Avila, so 16th century Carmelite, and she says this, Most of our problems in prayer originate from one single flaw, praying as if God were absent. Most of our problems in prayer originate from one single flaw, praying as if God 
were absent. Does anybody remember some, some years ago there was a song called uh, From a Distance, which I think Bette Midler had the, the hit with it. Um, I think Joe Coombs would do a really good version, actually. We won't, won't do that this morning. And, and the strap line of this song was, from a distance, God is watching us, God is watching us from a distance. I'm not sure there were any other lyrics. It was at a time when, you know, that this sort of the, always came back to the chorus of a song. And it was, you know, it's fine. It was catchy. And, but it actually kind of reflects, I think, maybe our understanding of God and our understanding of prayer, that we have this view that it's from a distance. And actually, you know, that's not true. Actually, God is with us. You know, if we are struggling day by day with uh, looking after somebody with chronic illness and we're coming to God in prayer, God is with you. If you're struggling at school as exams approach, coming to him day by day in prayer, God is with you. If you've got financial worries and you're stressed at work and you're turning to God in prayer, he's not from a distance. God is with you. And yes, as Jesus says, our father in heaven, there is a call to Uh, Look to God, who is other than us, who is greater than us, but he's not far away from us. And actually, the very kind of purpose of the incarnation of God coming in Jesus is that he is with us. And, uh, you know, four centuries ago, I think Teresa of Avila absolutely hit the nail on the head about prayer and one of the key things to understanding prayer. May your name be held holy. Um, Sally's actually preached this already this morning for me, which was, was great, just uh, said some things that I was going to say about the, the holy name of God. Uh, this would have had a resonance with the disciples, that there was a, a ancient synagogue prayer called the Kaddish, and near the start of it was uh, uh, were these words, magnified and sanctified be his great name throughout the world which he has created. And so when the disciples heard, may your name be held holy, they would have connected uh, with this ancient synagogue prayer. And as uh, as Sally was saying, you know, the name of God in the ancient world uh, was considered uh, holy. Why? Because it actually represented everything that God was in his nature, in his character, in his beauty. I think it's well summarized by John Stott, who says this, God's name is God himself, as he is in himself and has revealed himself. And we read a lot about the strength and the power of the name of the Lord in Scripture. Proverbs 10:18 says this: "The name of the Lord is a strong tower; the righteous run into it and are safe or are saved." Now, does anybody here remember the days when we used to sing a worship song? To yeah, do you, do you remember it was an action song? Yeah, I have to confess that um, action songs are not my favourite thing in the universe. Okay. <laughs> My wife may even notice that I've become slightly grumpy when there's an action song. But actually, this was a, is a good way of remembering things. I don't know if you can remember the, the actions, but it used to say, the name of the Lord, and we used to point up, is a strong tower. We did a hat thing. The righteous run into it. We'd lift up our names and lift up our knees and uh, kind of do all that. And... And are safe or are saved. And we, we did this thing. Which, it looks just like that emoji now, doesn't it? That, that, where that people kind of got this little face with smiley hands under it. And uh, as the song went on, it would, you'd have some people would be kind of pointing up. And some people would be kind of running and lifting their knees up. And, and others would be doing the hat thing. And it all, it all looked a bit rad- ragged. And um, it may have all looked a bit tragic. But it was actually making... <laughs> Uh, a very good point that actually, you know, the name of the Lord, we can actually run into who God is in our lives and in the place of prayer, we can run into uh, this shelter, this refuge who is God himself in his beauty, in his holiness, in his strength, in his humility, in his kindness, in his love, in his goodness. We can run in to who God is. That's what it means to run into the name of the Lord. And actually, reverence for the name of the Lord is is important. It's something we do see Jesus do in his relationship with his Father. There's another great prayer of Jesus, which is John chapter 17, known as the great high priestly prayer, before Jesus goes to the cross. Uh, And in it, if you trace it through, uh, there is an occasion where he refers to his Father as Holy Father, and another occasion where he refers to him as Righteous Father. 
So this Jesus who calls us to know intimacy with Abba Father also has great respect for his heavenly Father. I spoke a little bit around this theme when I last spoke, so I won't go into more detail here. But actually, honour and respect uh, are not antithetical to intimacy, but they're prerequisites really for it. And uh, I think it's interesting when we hear very matey terms about God, uh, in a way it's ironic that probably that can reflect sometimes a superficiality rather than a depth. Uh, And actually in, in, in many of our relationships really. And perhaps also if we see the Lord's Prayer, yes, there's something that can be prayed as it is, but almost as a template that can be fleshed out, that we can develop into certain areas of prayer through it, then we could also see this honouring God's name, this holding of God's name as holy, as an invitation to a a time of thanksgiving and a time of praise. I think in the times that we're in at the moment, it's, it's important, isn't it, to acknowledge when things are difficult, and I was chatting with some friends recently about uh, the importance of lament, and it's something we don't always do very well. Um, Certainly, we see honesty in Scripture. The Psalms are really honest about how things are. Uh, But there's also, you know, a possibility that we can stay too long with problems as well. And what that can do is actually we start to magnify the problem and almost give power, almost empower the problem and in, by doing that, we can somehow empower the enemy as well. So, um, yeah, just an interesting story. I was chatting with somebody in education recently who has pastoral care for students. And uh, I was just asking her, saying, how did they cope with lockdown? And, uh, uh, you know, has it changed things? And she uh, said, yes, uh, you know, it's the, they approach things differently now. And uh, there are changes. But interestingly, she said this, she said, you know, as adults, I don't think we've always helped them. We've told them so much that it's going to be really difficult and that they've missed bits of their education. And to quote her words, that they're a lost generation. We've almost locked them in to a, a, like a negative sort of cycle of being. And basically, she said this, no, essentially, we need to start to give our young people a different narrative. We need to start to give them something that is more hopeful and encourages them that they can make a difference. And it just struck a chord with me because I was reading actually in Judges at the time. I just read about the call of Gideon in uh, Judges chapter 6. A time when the Israelites were oppressed by Midian. And uh, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon who's kind of hiding away uh, in a wine press, hiding resources from the Midianites. And... uh, You know, things are bad, and the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon, and the first thing Gideon says to him is the question that we all have, really, why suffering? Why suffering? Why this mess? And actually, God doesn't deny that things are difficult. But he says, you know, I'm coming to you, Gideon, and I'm saying that you are valiant. And what I'm saying is actually, with me and with my call on your life, You can partner with me to make a difference, and I see you differently, and I see a different side to this, and I'm calling you into a different storyline with me. I'm not calling you to stay hiding away in the wine press. I think actually as we come into a place of praise in our prayer and kind of accept this invitation of the Lord's Prayer, that actually we are demonstrating faith. And you know, Faith is mostly demonstrated in bad times. I think faith is mostly demonstrated in bad times. It's great when we have good times. And as human beings, we need celebration. But if we read, for example, Hebrews chapter 11, one of my favorite chapters in the whole of Scripture. And if we read through it, actually, it's about people who have their backs against the wall. It's about people who are under pressure. It's about people when things weren't working well who were persecuted. And it's about people who said, do you know what? In spite of this, I'm going to choose to love and trust God despite what's going on. And actually, when we kind of come into this place of praise and our prayer, that's something that we're demonstrating and declaring as well. How do we do it? It's, uh, you know, begin simply, perhaps if we're praying privately, maybe just begin by thanking God, thanking God for clean water, good sanitation, clean clothing, maybe then going on just to thank him for friendships, 
perhaps then going on just to praise him for his gift to us in Jesus and forgiveness of sins. And actually, as we just move on with it, before we know it, we will have done 10 minutes of just giving thanks and giving praise to God. And we'll kind of come out of that phase of the prayer and likelihood is our minds and our hearts will have just been renewed and refreshed in something of the truth of the nature and character of God, of who God is. And it will probably just enable us to see things again from a different perspective. Hope and strength can just flow from Jesus into our hearts in that time again. And we can see that there's a, a different narrative that we can be part of and that we can partner with God, with the Holy Spirit, in prayer and in action, in our time and in our generation, to make a difference. And maybe when the disciples asked that question, Lord, teach us to pray, they saw that there was something about Jesus that actually he, his life is fruitful. His life is attractive with his father. And despite what is going on around, uh, he has this kind of relationship of prayer with his God and he is able to live fruitfully and make a difference.